So let me briefly describe the uh, three campaign conquests. Begins with them on the plains of Moab. They cross over to Gilgal where they circumcise the uh, males who had not done so as a way of rededicating themselves to obeying the covenant. And then they will come to the city of Jericho. Jericho is taken. But then in chapter 7, uh, they go to the city of Ai, but they are not successful there because of the sin of Achan, who took some items under the ban. An item under the ban means that it's dedicated to God for destruction. If you can destroy it, you burn it. If you can't destroy it, like a precious metal, then uh, it's dedicated to the sanctuary. Uh, Achan and his family took these things. They were found out by Joshua, who God, by lot, uh, figured out who it was. And uh, he confessed, and they executed him. And then they take the city of Ai, having dealt with sin in the camp. But then they go up to the city of Shechem, where they renew the covenant across from Mount Ebal. Israelites then move south into what becomes Judah. While they are there, they run into a tribe called the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites, by deceit, will make a peace treaty with them. They pretend to be non-Canaanites, even though they are Canaanites. They pretend to be not from the land, but from far away. In fact, they were from the land. And Joshua did make that peace treaty with them, even though they were among the people that uh, God had commanded to completely destroy and drive out of the land. But God told Joshua to go ahead and honor his agreement because he had sworn an oath to the Lord, and they took their oaths very seriously. Now, while they were in this territory near Gibeon, uh, there's this kind of strange passage where it talks about how on the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down for about a full day, and there's never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Now, this has given uh, rise to the question of, well, it looks like there's a long day where the sun stood still. Now, occasionally you'll see on uh, Facebook or Internet or some other uh, means they claim that uh, Joshua's long day has been found by NASA scientists. Uh, you can ignore that. It's an urban legend. There's no factual basis for it. Long story behind uh, that theory. It actually goes back to the 19th century in a Yale mathematician, but you can search Internet to uh, find out more about that. The question is, what's the nature of Joshua's long day in, uh, in Joshua chapter 10? And there's different uh, approaches. Some take it to be a pure miracle. In order for the sun to stop, you presumably would have to stop the Earth's rotation, which would be a stupendous miracle. Or it could be a cosmic event in which uh, the light was refracted by God so that it stayed in the same place in the sky, even though the Earth continued to turn. Or others say that, well, this is all poetry. It's a, actually a quote from the book of Jasher, which is one of the sources used by Joshua. Uh, and it could be hyperbolic. To say that the sun stood still was to say that, like, I stood in that line for an eternity. And so perhaps it's hyperbole just to say that it seemed like the day was extended so that they could go ahead and win the battle. Or others uh, interpret still by another meaning of the uh, root uh, 
a damam, uh, which means to be silent. And so perhaps the sun was silenced, either due to an eclipse or something else that kept the day cool so that the men had the strength to continue the fight. In any case, uh, that's a tech, uh, exegetical uh, issue of uh, Joshua's long day. Then they continue their uh, campaign up to Hatsor, up in the northern part of the country, where they defeat uh, Jabin, king of Hatsor. And then at the very end, they list 31 kings in all whom they had defeated in the conquest. The next section of the book is the division of the land, where each tribe received its portion. Uh, the only exception is uh, Reuben and Gad and half of Manasseh chose to stay east of the Jordan River. Technically, that is outside the Promised Land, but uh, uh, they got an agreement to stay there rather than uh, to go in. The other tribes could have more. But the, the point here is that God is keeping his uh, promises of uh, giving them the land. Now they are actually in the land and beginning to divvy it up. Uh, chapter 22 deals with those two and a half tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. And there's a controversy in chapter 22 because they built an altar there while the other tribes at first saw as rebellion against uh, their worship at the tabernacle's altar, and so he has to deal with that problem. Chapter 23, the leaders are exhorted to obey what is written in the law of Moses and to remain faithful to the Lord. And then in chapter 24, uh, Joshua gives a farewell speech calling on the nation to renew its covenant with God. That again occurs at Shechem, the same place where they built an altar of stone in uh, Joshua chapter 8 in fulfillment of a uh, command that's in Deuteronomy. And they call on Israel to renew the covenant, which they accept. Uh, just a little bit of the famous line in, in this uh, exhortation. Uh, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers, which they serve beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord and uh the others agree, yes, we will serve the Lord. Quickly, some theological themes in Joshua. You have the land promise. That's a, one of the central themes of this book. God is a God, promise keeper. He promised to the patriarchs that uh, he would give them the land, and now he's keeping the promise uh, stated explicitly in chapter 1 and verse 6. The land promise also is used by the New Testament uh, typologically. The land foreshadows heaven. God gave Israel an inheritance. It uses that word quite often. So the land was Israel's inheritance. Peter talks about how God has given us an inheritance reserved in heaven for you. And so this inheritance language uh, in Peter draws upon the inheritance language of Joshua, showing uh, rest in the promised land is a foreshadowing of the inheritance of heaven. Uh, speaking of rest, uh, that's a term that's uh, used quite often, that when they entered the land, God would give them rest from their enemies. And again, the New Testament uh, uses this language typologically. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, it talks about how uh, Jesus, whose uh, name is uh, in Greek is the same as Joshua, uh, gave a rest that's greater than the Joshua, the book of Joshua's rest. Uh, he gives the rest of salvation. Hebrews uh, chapter 3 and 4. The covenant and the covenant blessings and cursings. Uh, Joshua is exhorted to obey the covenant stipulations in order to be successful. Uh, the ark shows up as a symbol of that covenant, plays a prominent role in chapters 3 and 4 and uh, uh, beyond. 
And then the Aiken incident shows that violation of the covenant, covenant can lead to judgment and failure in chapter 7. They renew the covenant two times in the book, in chapter 8 and in chapter 24. And it's a reminder that we too need to obey God's commandment to have success and periodically renew our covenant relationship with God. Another theme is holiness. God appears in the book of Joshua as a warrior. He shows his holiness in wiping out the Canaanites. Now there's a danger for us in having an overly sentimental view of God, viewing God only as a God of love. But God is also a God of judgment, a God of holiness. In the person of the angel of the Lord, he shows up as a warrior, as the captain of the troops in chapter 5, 13 through 15. There's a typology here too. In Revelation 19, Christ shows up as a warrior leading the heavenly armies on a war horse, fighting against the beast and the false prophet. And you could say that the destruction of the Canaanites by Joshua and his armies is a foreshadowing of the ultimate judgment on sinners at the end of the age, at the last judgment, foreshadowing, you might say, the judgment of hell. Holiness is also seen for the people. Joshua demands God's people to be holy. They need to observe the sign of the covenant which is circumcision, which is sometimes compared uh, in Colossians in the New Testament, compared with baptism for Christians. And they should observe Israel's distinctive feasts, like the Passover, just as we Christians have a distinctive feast, uh, the Lord's Supper. And lack of holiness, as in the Achan incident, could mean judgment. God had to discipline Israel for disobeying his covenant. And of course, the New Testament also encourages church discipline as well. There are heroes of faith. Joshua's the most prominent one. And the book of Hebrews alludes to Joshua when it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled seven days. Joshua appears as a new Moses, a keeper of the law. He shows courage in war. He meets God on holy ground where he must remove his sandals, again uh, mimicking what happens with Moses at the burning bush in uh, Exodus uh, 3 and verse 5. And then you also have another hero of faith, an unlikely one, Rahab the prostitute. Hebrews says of her that by faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And likewise, uh, uh, it says in James, was not Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? Uh, James uses that to show that her faith was shown by her works and uh, the faith that's true faith will in fact have deeds that go along with it. Well that's a quick introduction to Joshua. We'll have some other matters about it in the next video.